what are the basic treatments for Parkinson's and can you tell us how, how they work? So the basic loss that we talked about, and it's an oversimplification, but mm -hmm. for most intensive purposes it, it works, is the loss of dopamine. So you've got these dopamine receptors in your brain and they're kind of looking around for, for dopamine because there's a deficiency. So most of our treatments are designed to try to replace that in some manner, shape, or form. Either to keep your dopamine around for longer by slowing its breakdown or by giving things that look like dopamine or actually turn into dopamine in the brain which then get those dopamine receptors the information they need to pass along. And Thankfully, since you know the 70s at least, we have had very good sort of dopaminergic options. It doesn't address everything, and it's not without its potential side effects, as we mm -hmm. can talk about, but it has made a significant difference in quality of life and life expectancy uh, and works very well for certain of the, of the main motor symptoms. Can you talk about the different types of medications? Yeah. Well, thankfully, we have a lot to talk about, mm -hmm. um, and that's been the case certainly since the 1970s, although there were treatments even before that. Um, we talked about dopamine being the main missing ingredient. So a lot of our therapies are aimed at boosting the dopamine levels because patients still have some, they just don't have enough, and they still have their dopamine receptors, the things in their brain looking for these dopamine, uh, basically looking for dopamine. And so most of our medicines are designed to increase their, uh, their level. And we can do that by slowing the breakdown of dopamine, mm -hmm. giving something that looks like dopamine that the cells accept, the receptors accept, or something that actually turns into dopamine, which is the gold standard. Can you uh, give a few examples of um, different medications within those uh, classes that you just described? So starting with uh, dopamine, what we do is we give the precursor, which mm -hmm. is carbidopa levodopa, and the levodopa is changed in the brain into dopamine. So it, the dopamine receptors are looking around and basically get the dopamine and are able to help with movement, help with walking, and often help the tremor and other symptoms. Um, and it's very effective. It's, it's the most effective medicine we have. We have other things that replicate the effect of dopamine that look like dopamine, and they're called dopamine agonists. And there's several of them. Some of them are in pill form, some of them in patch form. But basically, the receptor, the dopamine receptor that's looking for dopamine accepts this. It says it's close enough, and it's mm -hmm. not as potent, but it has certain other potential advantages and, and disadvantages that mm -hmm. uh, make it appropriate for certain patients. Uh, and then the other medicines are... Uh, slowing the breakdown of the dopamine, keeping it around longer. Mm -hmm. And there are some non-dopaminergic medicines, medicines that work on the cholinergic system, which is another mm -hmm. system that's mm -hmm. affected, uh, and on other sort of aspects of Parkinson's from different angles. What are some of the side effects or common side effects associated with these medications? Well, uh, all medicines, of course, have them. Uh, each class has its own side effect propensity. So uh, if we look at the classic medicine that we talked about, dopamine, levodopa, uh, it has certain side effects that usually patients kind of get used to and go away when you're first taking it, things like nausea. Um, it can cause sleepiness. It can drop your blood pressure a little bit and cause lightheadedness. Um, the main side effects that we keep an eye out for are the ones associated with long-term use, um, where the sort of response to the medicine can start to fluctuate, and at mm -hmm. the peaks you can get what are called dyskinesias, these extra movements that mm -hmm. some people may be familiar with. Um, and so part of the art of treating is getting patients to have a good response without overshooting the mark or mm -hmm. undershooting it. And some of these other medicines, like the dopamine agonists, like the ones that slow the breakdown, can help sort of fine-tune the regimen so you're sort of in that zone where you're getting good symptom control without the side effects. Now, there we, we have a lot of um, great... Uh, medications, um, options to treat patients. How do you, in your practice, choose which medication to start a patient on uh, after you've diagnosed them? You know, there's a lot that goes into that. I, I really think that you have to talk to the patient, understand mm -hmm. 
I think you have to take a step back and say, does this patient need to be treated, mm -hmm. right? So most of our medicines, as we understand it, are symptomatic, meaning they help the symptoms, but they don't change the progression. So sometimes people come with very mild symptoms, and mm -hmm. the first question is, do we need to give you anything? It's okay in some cases to just observe mm -hmm. and work with physical therapy and exercise and other uh, alternative approaches. But once they reach a point where they need the medicine, that's where the conversation will come up of which of these is right for that patient. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that once patients start to have motor disability or really their quality of life is starting to be impacted um, negatively, uh, that's the the most appropriate time to initiate treatment and having that conversation as to which class of medication to, to go with is, um, is important. Um, are there any other advanced therapeutics uh, out there for Parkinson's? There are. I mean, there are infusion therapies, mm -hmm. so trying to deliver the medicine in a more sort of, I don't say physiologic, but a more sort of slow and steady manner, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like you think of an insulin pump, well, mm -hmm. maybe something like a dopamine pump where we can give them lower amounts more regularly, and there are patients who are uh, appropriate for that. Uh, and there are other medicines we haven't really talked about, sort mm -hmm. of rescue medications that mm -hmm. kick in very quickly and uh, can give people sort of a bridge if they're finding that they need more at a given particular time. Uh, and newer formulations that are coming out. So there's a lot, there's a lot sort of in the pipeline as well.